been a good it's been a good book so far. We've been getting on pretty well. Uh, last week, if you remember, we had a pretty significant thing happen where they finished the walls, um, and so that's after a really important step like that. Like the whole point of the book so far has seemed to be let's just build these walls, let's have a city for our people, and then we're sorted. But I think this next step. Uh, is actually really super important. Um, I try to think, like, what's the, what's the point of having this big city and these lovely walls for God's people if they're not even going to be God's people and if they're not going to have his word and his life in them? And so today I'm going to be talking about building a spiritual life instead of building walls. Uh, and instead of grabbing bricks, we're going to be grabbing the word and we're going to be grabbing scripture, um, as you saw uh, just there as Joe read. And um, so, like, when I think of uh, us coming here, it's very similar to what we see in this passage here. It says in verse 1 that all the people get together uh, as one man. And like, that's just what we're doing here. We're getting together, and we're about to hear from God's word. And we already heard from God's word, and we've been singing his praises. And so throughout this passage, we're going to just be looking at, we're going to be looking at ways that this passage compares to what we do uh, in church here. Um, and... Uh, just, I think it's very similar how you know people have been preparing all this time in the book of Nehemiah. They've been building a city, and it just it reminds me of how we prepare here every morning, and we get the chairs ready, and we get the speakers and sound ready, and we get the hospitality ready, and the kids get ready upstairs. And there's all this big work. I'm thinking, what's the point of that? All that effort and work if we're going to come here and not even hear God's word? And it's the exact same as that that city there that that they just built. What would be the point of having all that effort without God's word and without His life? Um, and so, a key theme in this oh, it's about to happen. A key theme in this in this passage is uh, understanding. Is that understanding? It comes up five times. It's mentioned five times in this book or in this passage itself, uh, and it says here in Hosea four six that uh, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, and so I think that just re- reinstates again why how important it is for this city to have life inside it, and to have life you have to have the word because it says here that without the word and without knowledge, your people perish and people are destroyed, um, and so just getting into it. There's Ezra, starts off, he's the spiritual leader. So there's a book in the Bible also called Ezra, and that's this guy. So Ezra and Nehemiah were like, were like uh, partners, I suppose. Ezra was the governor, he was the political leader, uh, and Ezra would have been the religious leader. Um, and so as we begin to understand the importance of understanding, I want to say my whole big idea about this is that understanding Scripture brings life. And we, we see this passage, I think, is divided into three distinct parts. We see how it brings life in worship. Uh, it brings life in repentance and re- rejoicing. And it also brings life in action. So the first point was the, it brings worship. And we see in verse 1, they gather as one man, um, like us, just in unity. And they gather at the water gate. Uh, just a quick interesting fact, uh, it's called Watergate because there was a spring outside that they used to bring water from into the temple. And I think it's really fitting that we're talking about giving life by the word and like just what better picture for life is there than water. Uh, and people would describe this passage here as the first ever revival because the people had been out in captivity for years and this was a revival of the spiritual life of the people. And so I just thought it was cool how the, the water symbolizes life here again and it symbolizes revival. Uh, it's important to also note the location because it wasn't in the temple because uh, if, if it was in the temple uh, it would only be men allowed into the temple at that time and so another really good point here is that the scripture is for everyone and it's not just for the, the elite and the upper class and the uh, religious people uh, religious leaders rather or it's just for everyone um, and it also says there in verse 2 it says that it's men and women and all who could understand. So it's not just men and women, but it's also kids. I think uh, uh, Jewish people become men at 12. That's when their bar mitzvah is. So it's even kids under 12 who could understand what they were hearing. Um, and that just reminds me again of uh, our Brandon and Ernie upstairs, who have just been absolutely amazing since they came over, you know, working super hard. Uh, and it's, we see here in, in the scripture how seriously important and how serious God takes, like teaching kids scripture and having that life to them at a young age and so like like Mike said a while ago let's just thank them and be grateful for them uh, I think it's a really important thing that they're doing 
Also in verse 2 it mentions uh, it's the first day of the seventh month, and that's important, but we'll talk about it later. Uh, and also in verse 3, we see that he speaks uh, from early morning into midday, he reads from the word. Um, that's like the best part of five or six hours, and we complain about how long Mike preaches sometimes, so uh, we don't have an excuse here, uh, because they were there for like five or six hours listening to read, uh, Ezra read from the law. Uh, in verse 4, we, it describes the wooden platform that he's on with the rest of the guys that uh, Joe named. Uh, st- something similar to the stage over there, I suppose, that we don't use yet, but we, we might use it. Uh, the important thing to note is that it's not Ezra and the people who are important because they're up on this platform, but it says that, uh, you know, I believe that it's the word that's important, so that all could see the word, and that's where the true importance is, is in the word. Um, and in verse 5, it says... Uh, no, that is verse 5, yeah. The scri- it said the scripture is uh, above them all and they can see it. Uh, and in verse 6, it gets to really my first point. Um, it says in verse 6 that when Ezra opened the, the word, he blessed the Lord. They all, all the people said amen. And then lifting up their hands uh, and bowing their heads, they worshipped. Um, and that's my first point today, is how uh, reading scripture and understanding scripture brings worship and brings life in worship. Um, we see here in Colossians 3.16, uh, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And so that just paints a really clear picture. It's one of my favorite verses, actually. Uh, I think it, as a worship leader especially, it just makes my job really clear. Uh, and it just talks how letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly, and that's what I'm talking about, is getting that understanding scripture into your hearts. And when you understand like the work of Christ, like it mentions here, when that's dwelling in you richly, like that's just going to pour over in, in singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Uh, and in here we see how it, it pours over in lifting hands and bowing down in worship. And there's a, a, always there's clapping and stuff like that that we do. But right now, just because it's here in verse 6, I want to focus on... Um, and lifting hands. Uh, it's something that we did last week when Mike asked us to lift our hands, you know, it, like asking the Lord to strengthen our hands. But uh, I feel like some people might feel uncomfortable doing it, and that's, that's totally fine. Like, it's not for everyone to feel comfortable doing. But what the point I'm trying to make today about lifting hands is that it's actually really biblical. And, you know, it can seem like a kind of really crazy charismatic thing sometimes, and especially people who have been brought up more conservatively like that. Oh, it's only the super crazy that denomination or whatever that lift their hands but actually we don't do it just because it's evangelical tradition or whatever we actually do it because it's it's actually extremely biblical i i, I remember when i was in i lived in, in the states before and i taught a class on corporate worship uh, for a drug rehab and like i remember doing a, a huge study into this and i just i was blown away by how biblical it was there was just so many references to it uh so many hundreds of references to lifting hands and in, in in scripture uh, and i'm just going to go through a small few of now some of my favorite ones there's psalm 63 4 says so i will bless you as long as i live in your name i will lift up my hands psalm 134 2 says lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the lord and then a new testament one is first timothy 2 8 it says then i desire that in every way uh, or in every place that the men should pray lifting holy hands um besides that there are three of my favorite pastors about lifting hands. It makes it really super clear and super easy to understand that God wants us to worship him and engage him by lifting hands. But also, there's countless more references uh, that aren't translated as lifting hands in English, like the small thing. There's the Hebrew word yada, and it's, just, it's usually translated praise in, in, in our English Bible, but it actually means to worship with extended hands. So there's 90 times, in, it's mentioned 90 times in the Old Testament, that we just breeze over and it would just say, oh, praise the Lord here, praise the Lord there. I have a list of, of, the, of the passages if you really care to look them all up. But there's, it's 90 times in the Old Testament that it actually says praise and it means to worship uh, with extended hands. So for me, it, I, I did grow up kind of lifting my hands and stuff like that. But knowing that it's really biblical uh, really, really helped me to enjoy it more and engage with God more and worship, you know. Uh, knowing that he actually has put it in his word. He wants me to worship him by raising my hands. It just makes me freer and more open to do it. And I mean, like, it's not, it's not to be forced or faked either. We, we, I mean, that, we know that, I suppose. Like, sometimes we're just not able. But even sometimes I'm just, like, not feeling or whatever, or th- I don't even know the words to the song or whatever. But what is always true and is that God is worthy to be worshipped. He's worthy to be praised. 
And one way that he wants to be worshipped and praised is by lifting hands. And sometimes, you know, I just, I'm, I'm, not, I'm weak. Like Mike talked about last week, I need strength in my hands. Sometimes I'm just not feeling it. Sometimes I'm in bad form. But sometimes I just lift my hands and I give God praise because I know all that he's done for me. And I know that he's worthy to be praised regardless of how I'm feeling. Um, that, that has to be one of my favorite parts of worship. It's just when, you know, when I'm surrounded by people that are singing and I get to lift my hands and worship God. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really natural too, I think. You know, for me, uh, like I'm a big Liverpool fan, and when I'm watching Liverpool and they score a great goal, I, I just like I'm like yes, what a goal! <laughs> and I was like that last week when we scored what I thought was a winner in like the last minute, and I was on my knees basically like yes, and then Spurs came up and scored an equaliser in the last second, so I was crying then. Uh, but like understanding that it's biblical, I think, really helps us to to push on with it, you know. Uh, It's not just something we do because we feel it or it's emotional, even though it is emotional and we can feel it sometimes. What's most important to understand is that it's it's actually really biblical. Um, And I feel like that the more and more we understand what God has done for us and how we want to be worshipped, I think it just makes it easier for us to worship him uh, in that that way. Um, the, The second point... I have is the, that worship brings repentance and rejoicing. So we saw in the first little section that Ezra's beginning to read the word. Um, as, he, as he opens the word and blesses God, the people uh, bow down and they, uh, they, praise, they praise the Lord. Uh, and then just in verse 7, we see the people are starting to be helped by these other, these other helpers that, that Joe named again. Um, Ezra's helpers, that they, go, they start to go into the crowd that's there. And they begin to explain uh, the word to them. Um, and that just straight away reminds me of, of community groups that we have. Like we meet together here as one man uh, on a Sunday. And then throughout the rest of the week, then we have community groups where we break up into smaller groups. And we have all little helpers that have been prepared and have a sheet to, to d- dive into. And that we can just understand the scripture a bit better. Because, I mean, it's hard to just to get it all in here on a Sunday morning. We don't have enough time to deep it, dive deep into things. But on a, on a Tuesday or Thursday or whatever, we have that ability to, you know, go a bit deeper, scratch uh, beneath the surface a small bit. And, um, yeah, I think there's, there's way more depth there. And that just reminds me of that straight away there. But on hearing the law and when the law is, um, the book of the law is explained to them, um, the people in verse 9, it says that they wept as they heard the words of the law. Um, it's kind of a strange, it's strange enough when you, when you look at it first because it says it's meant to be a holy day and they're trying to have a good time. And then when Ezra reads out the law and people start crying, they're like, oh, whoops. But that's actually a really normal response, I think anyway. Um, I know for me, I really understand, like when I, when I look at the law and look at, I, I believe there's 613 commandments in the Old Testament law, um, just about all sorts, that you, stuff you can't do, stuff you should do. And when I look at that, I'm like, yeah, God, I actually am so broken. I'm so sinful. I'm so in need of you to provide forgiveness for me. Um, and that's, that's a good place to be at. Like, we don't stay there, though, as Christians, but it's a good place to start. You know, it's a really important place for us to come to, to know salvation in Jesus is knowing that through the law, we can see that we're broken. You know, I, I mean, the last time I spoke, I mentioned the quick analogy about when I broke my collarbone, the doctor gave me an x-ray and showed me that the x-ray um, showed that my bone was broken. And that's exactly where these people are right now. It, it hurts. Their spirit's broken because they realize how broken and sinful they are before God. Um, this is the first time they've probably heard the law in years because they were in exile. And then they're, just, they're probably thinking back to when they were in exile in, 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 in the Syrian Empire. And they're thinking, oh, I didn't do any of this law when I was away for all those years. I didn't, I didn't even think about obeying these laws. And they were just so broken and so, um, so broken that they were actually just weeping and crying. But if you're at that place now, that's okay. It's okay to feel convicted. It's a good thing. There's no need to... There's only to be embarrassed or anything. It's okay to be broken uh, by God's law, but there's much more than that, and you don't have to try to fix it yourself. There's actually great news. And so if, if anyone's here who is in that position, who doesn't really know their salvation in Christ, who haven't really made um, that kind of hard decision to, to believe in the sacrifice Jesus made from, uh, there, there is a great step ahead, and there's a, there's, a great, um, there's a greater understanding of the law and of what Jesus has done for us, then we don't have to just sit here and try to earn God's love through the law, because we never will.
Um, and I just want to point out how in verse 8, it says that the people were around and they were clearly, uh, they, they were uh, giving sense, is that they gave sense is the actual words that they use. The helpers gave sense to the, to the people. And like I mentioned in verse 2, it was the, it was the seventh month of, of the year for them. And it's important because that's actually the month that they'd celebrate the atonement. And the atonement is, uh, is really important um, for, for Jews. It, it, the word atonement just means to cover or to reconcile. Um, and that was the time of the year where they would make a sacrifice to pay for their sins. And I'm sure these people, were, the, the helpers were explaining and Ezra were explaining, look, yeah, you're broken. You've made all these terrible errors. They'll, you'll never be able to keep the law. But God has provided a way for our sins to be forgiven. And on that day of atonement, they'd sacrifice um, goats and they'd do burnt offerings uh, to, to, for, to forgive the sins of the people. But it actually, um, it actually, there's, that actually, I, I believe, points to a greater Messiah, and that's Jesus. And so these people would have had, in the, the book of the law is the first five books of the Old Testament that they've been reading from. It's called the Pentateuch. Um, so there's tons of little pointers and prophecies in those first five books that they would have had reading right there um, that point to a greater Messiah, a champion that's coming. Um, the first one is Genesis 3.15. It says, um, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you, he shall, and you shall bruise his heel. This is just after the fall when Adam and Eve sinned. And um, this is God talking to the serpent who's Satan. And he says, yeah, my people have fallen now, but there's one coming, Eve's seed, who will crush your head and you'll bruise his heel. And that's, that's actually the first uh, prophecy of, of a coming Messiah in the Old Testament. There's also uh, Genesis 12, 3 is a promise to Abraham. And there was a, there's a couple as well in Genesis 13, 15 and 22, 18 of G God making promises to Abraham of a Messiah that's going to be coming. I think the best one there is 12, 3. It says, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And I think Paul in Galatians 3, 16 makes this really clear. You know, because reading those passages in Genesis there, you mightn't think, Oh, how do you know for sure that, that's, that he's talking about Jesus there? He's talking about a Messiah. Paul makes it really clear in 3.16 here in Galatians that uh, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. So we can, by having an understanding of Paul, uh, Paul's New Testament scripture, we can have a better understanding of the Old Testament scripture saying, you know, those promises to Abraham were actually about Jesus and they were actually about um the coming Messiah. So these people would have also had them. There's a couple more in um, in Genesis 49, 10, 12, and Numbers 24, 16, 19. The, one, the first one is a promise to, to Judah from Jacob about a champion that's going to come in his line. And then the other one in Numbers is a, a prophet Balaam. He makes a prophecy of a champion that's coming as well to save the people of Israel. Um, so that's, there's, they would have had plenty of prophecies and they would have had that hope and knowledge of one who was going to come and rescue them from their sins. And so... Um, what that, but I think these prophecies really point to, to Jesus and to his coming work. And I think the, most, the best picture of this is what we see in the atonement. Um, it's, so, it's just so obvious throughout scripture that God always prepares a sacrifice and he always has a, if, he always has a way of forgiving people's sins. It starts off, we see first in Genesis 22, you notice the story where Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac and lo and behold, a ram pops out of the bushes and he can sacrifice the ram instead. And that's, again, a picture of Christ. That's, that's one ram being sacrificed for one person. In Exodus 12, we have the Passover lamb. That's when Moses was trying to lead um, the people of Egypt out of uh, captivity or the people of Israel out of captivity in Egypt. And the story goes is that uh, God was going to kill all the, the firstborn of every family uh, in Egypt. But the, the way to protect your family from being, being killed was to have the blood of a Passover lamb uh, across your doorposts. Um, and that's such a symbol of the blood of Christ again, you know, that we can be saved from death through the blood of Jesus who covers us and uh, forgives our sins. Also, in Leviticus 16, that's where the, the Festival of Atonement comes from. Um, God explains in his law how we can take uh, uh, goats and burnt offerings and sacrifice them, and that, that will also forgive our sins. But this all, and that, that was for a whole nation, the atonement, 
Uh, so we see how Isaac's ram is, is a sacrifice for one person. We see in the Passover lamb that it's a sacrifice for one family. We see in Leviticus 16, the atonement is a sacrifice for the whole nation of Israel. But that's building up and building up and pointing to a greater, greater sacrifice that's going to come. And that greater sacrifice is Jesus Christ. And it says in John 1, 29, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's what we have now. We don't have to sacrifice lambs or rams or anything. And we have absolute the fullness of God's plan in Jesus and that plan is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we can believe in him and have our sins forgiven. And like, what greater, what greater reason is there to rejoice than that? And we see how in verse 10 that a celebration breaks out. Uh, Ezra asks them to you know, eat and drink the best food. He said, because um, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I, I, I fully believe that, you know, these people were right to be broken. They were right to be, like, so upset because they didn't obey the law. But the better understanding they had, the better understanding they had of the scripture and the better understanding they have of a coming Messiah, then that, that gave them reason to rejoice. They had so many reasons to rejoice knowing that God was going to, has provided a sacrifice for them already in the atonement. But even better, there's going to be a greater one who comes, a champion, who will die once and for all for the sins of all the world. Um, and like just a huge party breaks out. They're drinking and they're eating and they're having a great time. And, you know, it just shows the transition from repentance to rejoicing. The answer to that is Jesus. You know, if you're in this place and you're broken and you know that you're a sinner, I just want to say that God, it's a great place to be, but God has so much for you in Jesus. And, you know, there's nothing better than knowing that Jesus died for our sins and that he has paid every sacrifice that we could ever ever need and ever want, and that we could never go outside that, and we could never sin so much that it would nullify it or anything. Um, the last, the last um, point of the, of the three points I had was that understanding Scripture brings action. So we see how they worshipped at the start from um, a, a position of you know, seeing God's holiness in his word. They just bowed down and worshipped him. We saw how it brought repent the word brought repentance through the law that they knew how broken they were, and also brought rejoicing, looking towards a greater sacrifice in in in, in the coming Messiah. And then we see in from verse thirteen to eighteen a summary of um, understanding Scripture, bringing them to action. Like the, the, it, it it ended up being the the feast of booths is what they celebrated, um, and that was probably something that they hadn't done for years. It says here that they hadn't done it since the time times of Joshua, which was years and years beforehand. That uh, this festival was forgotten, um, for years while they were in captivity, and you know, there's things that as non Christians we would never care to do. Do you know there's there's commands in God's scripture that we would never care to do, and we would never know what's right or wrong. But when we know God's love and we know God's provision and his sacrifice. I believe that there's a desire to want to obey God's law. And there's also a desire and an ability to do God's law that's brought up in our hearts by understanding what God has done for us um, in Jesus. Uh, it says in Jeremiah 31, 33, God says, in prophesying to Jeremiah, he says, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. That's one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. You know, it just paints a really strong picture of how God doesn't just, you know, forgive our sins and leave it to us then to, like, to keep ourselves in, in check and to keep ourselves right and to live our own lives as best we can. He, he not only gave us a great sacrifice in Jesus and forgiveness of our sins, he also puts his law on our hearts so that we can actually obey him and so that we can actually live righteous lives. Um, I love how it's saying it's, it's written on their hearts. I read it on their hearts. And I know, that's, I know that's true in my own life. I know that whenever I try on my own strength to, to be a better person, it just, it just fails miserably. Whenever I try more on my own strength to read the Bible more, whatever, it just, it just fails miserably. But I know that when I'm, when I'm focusing on God and all that he's done for me, and when I'm focusing on the great sacrifice that Jesus has done for me. I know that in my heart, naturally, affections are stirred up for Jesus and for the Lord and for other people. And that naturally, I'm able to, to, to act in a more righteous way than I could ever do in, of, in and of myself. And I think that's just a great promise there in, in Jeremiah 31, 33. And then in Romans 7, 6, it says that um, we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. This is also one of my favorite verses in the New Testament about this sort of, this sort of actions coming from having the Spirit and having God's law in our hearts. You know, it's important to note that um, 
like the festivals and sabbaths and sacrifices of lambs and stuff aren't meant for us today because we don't, it says here, we don't serve in the old way of the written code, but we serve in the new way of the spirit. And that spirit is within us and it's causing us to, to you know, be decent to people and you know, be generous and giving and loving and to be better just husbands and wives and sons and daughters and friends. It's from the inside out. And it's, it, it, goes much, it goes much deeper than just obeying a, few, a set of rules on a piece of paper. It goes, so far, it goes so far beyond that and it goes into the very depths of our heart. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing that God doesn't see and doesn't care about. Like you know, we saw Jesus talk about how you know if you hate your brother in your heart, you've, you're you're just you've just as well have, as you might as well have killed him. It's just the same thing. Same as if you look at a woman in lust, you might as well have committed adultery because it's the same thing. And so that's really convicting. Like that's really hard to know that even we sin, even when we're not doing anything, even when we're thinking wrong or our hearts are wrong, we're still sinning. But it also, God's provision goes deeper than the surface too and it goes into our hearts and God provides our hearts and our minds um, with the spirit to help us to just get along uh, in, in the life that he has for us. Um, it ends up in, in verse 18 at the very end, it says you know, they've been having a great celebration and it says that they had seven days of rejoicing and they had uh, one day of solemnness. Um, and that just, I think that's a good ratio. Like it's eight days, seven days of rejoicing, one day of solemnness. I think us as Christians and in our church, it can be the opposite. Sometimes we can have seven days of solemnness and maybe one day of rejoicing. Uh, I know that. For me, I'd love to see more rejoicing here because we have, I, I would say, seven times more reasons to be joyful than, than we have to be um, solemn and to be upset, you know. I really enjoyed worship this morning. Thanks, Dave. I know we're going to have some more worship. And I just, I know that when I know that God has done so much for me and that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me um, in my place and that he's the eternal lamb of God that takes away my sins forever, no matter what I do, I know that I have so much, so much reasons to be happy, so many reasons to be happy, knowing that I'm totally forgiven and clean in God's sight, um, knowing that I don't have to earn his love, I don't have to earn his affection. Um, that's, for me, that just gives me huge comfort and it gives me great reason to rejoice. Uh, and I know that we're going to have some more worship and I'm going to be rejoicing in my heart anyway uh, about all that God's done for me. And so how we respond to this, you know, there's the... There's the three things I want us to remember, you know, that God brings life uh, through his word in worship, repentance and rejoicing and in action. So some of us today, you know, it might be really important for us to understand God wants us to worship and it might be important for us to raise our hands. Maybe we feel like God's causing us to look, God, I know you're worthy of my worship. I know you want me to raise my hands. So I'm going to raise my hands and worship you, not because of me, not because I'm a great person, but because you're a great God and you deserve my worship. Some of us might be at a place of repentance and it might be really important for us to understand that we need to repent, um, that we need to realize that our sins are far greater than what we could ever make up for. Um, and we need to turn from our sins and that's what repent, repent means. It means to turn away and we need to re turn away from our sins and look to Jesus and say, even though I'm so wicked and so unrighteous and I could never earn your love, I know that you provided a way for me and I'm going to trust you. Maybe some of us need to do that. Maybe some of us just need to rejoice. Maybe some of us need to be reminded of all that God's done for us in Jesus and all we have in Jesus. And we just need to celebrate that uh, and really enjoy it and enjoy him. Uh, some of us need to act. Some of us maybe understand what God's done for us and, and have a true understanding of all that Jesus has done on the cross. Uh, and we know and feel that God is calling us to act on something and fix something or do something more. Uh, and I believe that we have the power through that, absolutely, but not in and of ourselves. And we have to understand that God is calling us to action, but only from a proper understanding of that. He already loves us. He's already done everything he, we could ever ask for in earning his love. And all we have to do is act out of that love and not for that love. And maybe some of us have to do all four, um, but... What I all want us to understand the most is that God has provided a lamb. That's, if there's one thing you remember from today, I want you to understand that God has provided a lamb, and that lamb is Jesus Christ. And regardless of your situation, regardless of what you've done, or, or how, regardless of how insecure or low you might feel, Jesus' sacrifice is more than enough. 
um, you know, he died for our sins once and for all. All we have to do is turn to him and believe in him, and we have complete satisfaction, and um, we're completely free from the wrath of God. And if that's not reason to celebrate, uh, I, I really don't know what is. And so let's just be mindful of his sacrifice, you know, as we take communion. I'm reminded again how in verse 10, Nehemiah calls him to eat and drink, and we're going to be eating and drinking now. We're going to be eating of his body, um, and, of his, and we're drinking of his blood. And that's just a great symbol, symbol of his great sacrifice, you know, his body that was broken for us on the cross in our stead, and his blood that was poured out for us to seal us into his new covenant and to forgive us of our sins. You know, let's just be mindful of that as we do it. Um, I know I love communion and I'm going to enjoy it today and it's going to be, we're, it's just important for us to be mindful of all that he's done for us um, and I'm just going to really enjoy it today I think. Uh, so I'm just going to pray and hopefully hopefully that God has spoken to some of us today um, but at the very least that we'd understand that God has provided Jesus for us that we don't have to stress or worry about earning his love ever again. All we have to do is believe in the sacrifice that Jesus has done for us. So I'm just going to pray. God, thank you so, so much. Um, we could never be grateful enough and we could never ever repay you for all that you've done for us. Um, thank you so much that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, um, to live a perfect life that we could never live, that he would obey the law perfectly and fulfill all the prophecies in your word perfectly and that he would just go to a cross and die in our stead, that we wouldn't have to suffer under your wrath, Lord, but that we could live in great love and we could live an abundant life all because of what Jesus has done. Thank you that he rose again from the dead victorious, Lord. Thank you that we have a living and breathing hope in, in your son and that we never have to worry about you failing us ever, ever because we know that you are a God that, God that never fails and we know that the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, will last forever regardless of how many times you mess up. So please, God, help us to be focused on you. Help us to understand that you have made a way for us to, to worship you and to have relationship with you without earning your love through works, Lord. But thank you also that we can understand that we can be called to works from that love. And thank you so much for all that you've done for us. You're such a great and amazing God, and we love you so much. In Jesus' name.